brought a Bible? I'd like for you to turn with me today to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 8 is our text today. A few weeks ago, uh, I was teaching a series on uh, idols and idolatry. I, I called it When Idols Fall. And we dealt with the uh, capture, 1 Samuel chapter 5, the capture of the Ark of the Covenant when the Israelites were defeated by the Philistines. The Ark of the Covenant was captured. It was drugged into the temple of Dagon. Remember, they brought it to their capital in Ashdod. And, and they marched down and placed the Ark of the Covenant like it was a trophy in the temple of their fish god Dagon and we know what happened it's an account we dealt with for a number of weeks uh, Dagon the next morning they came in and, and their big statue of Dagon had fallen on its face as if in obeisance before the Ark of the Covenant remember the Ark was called the glory of God it was called the mercy seat it's where God's presence dwelt in a manifest way on earth. God is everywhere present. But in that, it, it, with that Ark of the Covenant, God's manifest presence dwelt there in a unique, a very special and unique way. <clears throat> they stood the big statue of Dagon back up, and the next morning it had fallen again, this time decapitated and hands cut off as well and laid on the threshold of the door, and Dagon, again, on his face before the Ark of the Covenant. Then God smote the Philistines, smote them with horrible afflictions and diseases and so on, and that continued until they decided, you know, we really need to get this Ark of the Covenant back to Israel. Well, in that series, I was teaching on idolatry and the fact that God doesn't allow our idols to stand. It's an Old Testament account, but, you know, even those accounts have New Testament application. Uh, we looked, the last time I taught on, on the, this series, I, I dealt with uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 21, the closing words of John in that epistle when he said, Little children... Keep yourselves from idols. So for us as New Testament believers, we too are surrounded by idols and idolatry, and we live in a nation of idolaters. People don't realize they're idolaters, but the fact is multitudes are. So I want us to make personal application of the accounts that we read. Now, despite the terrible thing that happened when Israel themselves fall, fell into idolatry. They didn't learn much uh, because Israel would assimilate the idolatries of the heathen nations surrounding them. They would adopt their practices uh, despite the fact that God repeatedly told them, don't adopt the customs of the heathen. Don't do what the heathen do. Don't act like them. Don't embrace their idols. But repeatedly, Israel violated God's clear commands. And you can't get much clearer than Exodus chapter 20, when God says, uh, Thou shalt not have any gods before me, any other gods besides me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of any likeness that's in heaven above, or earth below, or the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not Bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. And he visits a special judgment upon idolaters that you don't see elsewhere in Scripture. In Exodus 20, he said he would visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Idolatry, such a pervasive sin that God reserve special judgments for it. You see, you curse your own children 
by making them idolaters as well, by dragging them into the, mo the vilest, the most heinous of sins against the holy God. There's one God, and he says he's jealous. A and that jealousy that God has for his people is not to be construed as some sinful jealousy, like maybe you're jealous over somebody's uh, nice new car. or uh, It's not sinful jealousy. It's the jealousy of a husband over his wife. He doesn't want her committing adultery. The jealousy of a wife over her husband doesn't want his eyes or heart straying to another woman. This is uh, the jealousy of one who loves. And God's jealousy is perfectly pure. And it's because he loves his people. He loved Israel and loves them still. He loves his church, which he calls his bride, the body of Christ, of whom he is the head. And you know, we too are called to love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We too ought to have a single eye and a single-hearted devotion to God and to God alone. Anything else, anything that comes between us and our pure worship of God can be construed as idolatry. Instead of remaining true to the, to the one true God, Israel repeatedly strayed and, and committed the sins that, that God called abominations. In Deuteronomy 6, beginning in verse 14, I'm, I'm just going to read a couple of verses. He said, you shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from the face of the earth. Well, sober warnings, and that's just one of numerous warnings in the Bible. Unfortunately, the Bible, the word of God, was largely ignored, and Israel continued to practice the same idolatry as the heathen nations around him. Now, having said that, I want you to fast forward with me from the time when God gave them the law. said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. When he uh, not only forbade idolatry, but, but pronounced special judgments upon those who committed these sins, we're going to fast forward now almost 700 years maybe 800 years. We're going to go from the time of the law of Moses and we're going to come to the time of Ezekiel. Ezekiel the prophet. Ezekiel the priest. Ezekiel who lived almost 600 years before Christ. And at this time, Israel, as a nation of people, an independent, that is independent from the control of other nations, Israel is now fading, fading very fast in the time of Ezekiel the prophet. In 605 B.C., Babylon carried away many of the Jews that lived in, in Jerusalem, that lived in, in Judah. Babylon just took them captive. He, and they carried them into Babylon and assimilated them into Babylon, or, or at least tried to. 605 B.C., thousands were taken. The, they, they chose the young, the virile, the handsome, the, the goodly, the wise, the, the most intelligent, and they drug them into Babylon. Years later, 597 B.C., this would be about eight, seven, eight years later, 10,000 more were carried off to Babylon. In that captivity, where the 10,000 were taken to Babylon, again, they took the young, the bright, the goodly, the most promising of the youth. Ezekiel was among them. So Ezekiel was taken from his home in Jerusalem. He was taken from his family, taken from all that he knew, all that was familiar with him, and brought on that long, circuitous route to Babylon about 900 miles away. As the crow flies, the trip to Babylon would have been about 500 miles, but, you know, they don't travel the way the crow flies. They, 
they have to go around mountains and valleys and hills and so forth, and it would take months to complete a 900-mile journey. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 3 that Ezekiel settled into a little settlement uh, along the river Chabar in a town called Tel Abib, uh, just south of Jerusalem. Now, he would, he would live there. Eleven years later, after his being brought to Babylon, eleven years later, Nebuchadnezzar had had enough of Israel, had enough of Jerusalem, and he marched his army in there and crushed the city and destroyed it completely. 586 B.C., they would destroy Jerusalem, they would destroy the temple, and they would utterly demolish uh, Israel as a nation. They would demolish them and, uh, and drag them into captivity. There would be no temple. There would be no Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant disappeared in that, in that time, 586 B.C., and has never been recovered. But before God finally destroyed Jerusalem, he started giving some of these prophets like Ezekiel messages to share with Jerusalem to tell them why God was going to demolish them and destroy them as a, as a nation and, and bring the temple down. Uh, so God called Ezekiel to prophesy in Babylon to his own people and to tell them why God was doing what he was doing, why he was destroying them. The book of Ezekiel, uh, it, it, it's a very incredible book. There's a series of visions that God gave Ezekiel, six or seven very profound, powerful visions, strange instructions. But what we're going to look at today is just one of those powerful and profound visions. So I hope you've turned with me to Ezekiel chapter 8. We're going to look at a few verses of Scripture. I think that uh, we can glean some present application from. Beginning in verse 1, It came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire. From the appearance of his loins even downward, fire. And from his loins even upward as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. God was going to take his prophet in a vision and bring him from his house beside the river Chabar and bring him all the way to Jerusalem in a vision and show him what was going on, what was going on there in the city of Jerusalem. Verse 3, he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my head and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looks towards the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. He brought him to the very precincts of the temple, and he showed Ezekiel what was going on in the most sacred precincts in all the earth. Now, the temple... Remember, this was God's temple. The, the Bible refers to it as God's house. If any place on earth was to be pure and holy, if there was any place on earth that was to hold to the scriptures, it was God's holy temple where God's presence was manifest. But there were things going on there that so grieved the heart of God, we'll, we'll look at these passages in a minute, but down in verse 6, he, he spoke about this, this image of jealousy in the entry, uh, 
that in verse 6 he said, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. The idea here is that God was going to abandon his own temple because of what they were doing. They erected idols, false gods, uh, in the very temple of God, practicing heathen customs. We'll see, verse 14, weeping for Tammuz, bringing the greenery of, uh, of the false religions into their house, heathen religious practices that God called abominations. Maybe they thought they were improving on the worship of God. Maybe they thought God would applaud them because they, they were going to Judaize the pagan customs. You know, we'll just, we'll just Judaize them. We'll redeem them. Like people say today, you know, we'll redeem heathen customs. We'll Christianize them. But what they actually do is paganize Christianity. God called them provocations in verse 17. And in verse 18, he said, Therefore will I also deal in fury. My eye will not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. That's pretty strong language that God pronounces these things against his people. But let me tell you why he does that. Because they knew better. Amen. Because they had his clear word and they knew better. And because they had been warned continually, not just once, but repeatedly. All you have to do is read the scriptures. You'll see all the prophets railed against the idolatry that, that they assimilated into their worship. What I want us to look at today is this chapter in just a little bit more detail because I believe we can apply it. Uh, to the 21st century. I want us to see what Ezekiel saw and where he saw it. First, let's see that God brought him right into the holy temple, the very house of God in Jerusalem. He said, verse 3, you'll look there with me again, he brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looks toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy that provokes to jealousy. This is the very center, remember, of divine worship, where sacrifice, God had ordained that sacrifice be offered there. This is where the priest attended. This is where the Levites sang. This is where true worship was supposed to go forth. This is where praises were sung and this is where prayers were made. This was the, this was the house of God. Amen. And if any place should have been pure and should have been kept pure, it would have been the place where true worship went forth. The one place on earth, the one place on earth that God had described as singular in distinction, the one place on earth. And here it was defiled and polluted by idols and false worship and heathen practices. He says there was the image of jealousy, verse 3, that provoked to jealousy. The image of jealousy. What this refers to is a huge image, a statue that had been erected right in the entryway. Verse 5 says, Son of man, lift up your eyes toward the north. I lifted my eyes towards the north. Behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. So right in the most conspicuous place, they had erected this huge, probably a Baal, probably a statue of Baal, uh, This, and it's not like they were ashamed. I mean, they put it in the most conspicuous place they could. Here is an object totally foreign to Judaism on display right in the entryway, clear for everybody to see. I'm sure it was very impressive to look upon. Imagine coming in, coming into the temple of God 
where truth is supposed to be upheld and proclaimed. And there you find in a prominent, conspicuous place some heathen idol. Some foreign, something foreign to Judaism. I mean, almost be like coming into a church and finding a big, giant Christmas tree or something on a stage. I mean, similar to that, you know. Something foreign to Christianity. Something that uh, you don't put on conspicuous display as though you're proud of bringing things like that into the house of God. Things that people actually should be ashamed of. Yeah. You don't put, you don't bring that to the house of God. What's wrong with people? But if you look at any pictures of what's going on in Christianity today, they are so proud. They are so proud. They put on such conspicuous display Amen. what has no business in a place that's supposed to proclaim truth. Amen. In verse 4, this is what Ezekiel says, Behold, the glory of the Lord of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. This is the very temple where the glory of the Lord dwelt in the holy place, and yet here in the holy place they bring in these abominations. God was so grieved with what was going on in his own house. Verse 6, he said, Furthermore unto me, son of man, do you see what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel commits here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. It would cause me to forsake my holy place, he said. It would cause me to forsake my holy place. They have displaced me. But turn thee yet again, thou shalt see greater abominations. Here's what God said. Wait, you haven't seen anything yet. I'm going to show you greater abominations. Verse 7, very interesting. He brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then he said unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I digged in the wall, look, behold, a door, a hidden door, a secret door. How many movies have you seen where there was some hidden door, a secret entry? You piddle around the fireplace. Oh, look, what if I pull this? And the look, a hidden door. Some mysterious place down deep in the dark, you know, some passage to to travel pull a book off the shelf and look this door appears all of a sudden where hidden activities you know, what could possibly be in this hidden door well if there was flagrant idolatry in the entryway imagine what was hidden in the dark places in the secret places imagine what was hidden behind closed doors it's kind of like you ever, you ever turned over a rock that's been in your, your yard for a while, see what's, hit, what's hidden underneath it? All kind of little things scurry around. I had to move some big pavers in my backyard recently, and when I moved them, behold. <laughs> you want to put it back. You know, see all those things hidden under there. Well, if they violated the law openly, Proudly. Imagine. We can't imagine what they would do in secret. This is what, what God's telling him. So what we're going to see now is what men do in secret. Now, men, I use that generically because it applies to all of us. You see, I want us to make application to our own selves and our own lives. There are things, I believe, in in almost every life that we allow ourselves to do and excuse ourselves for doing and even justify ourselves for doing. Amen. And then there are those hidden things. Then there are, there are the things that, that are behind closed doors. What men do in secret. Verse 9, here's what 
the Lord said. He said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do there. Go see what they do in secret behind closed doors. Verse 10, So I went in and I saw. And behold, every form of creeping thing, an abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Every kind of of idol, of false god, a pantheon, basically, of the assorted deities that were worshipped by Israel's heathen neighbors, the gods of Egypt and Babylon, the Canaanite gods, the Baals, the calves, the sun gods, the beasts, the four-footed creatures, all, all the idols of every kind. And of course, you know, what goes along with idolatry is the attending wickedness because licentiousness, immorality, ungodliness, drunkenness, all of this is part, it's part and parcel of idolatrous worship. It's why the flesh likes it. It's why people like it. And, and then in verse 11, he says, And there stood before them, there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. 70 men of the ancients. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence that the Jewish Sanhedrin that presided in Jerusalem was comprised of 70 men. These were the leaders of the nation. These were the the lawmakers and those who made sure that the law was upheld, civil, the civil law, as well as the moral law, as well as the, the, the ceremonial laws. These were the elders, as it says here. Seventy men of the elders of the house of Israel. This shows us how pervasive the idolatry had become. It didn't just influence some of the people or some of the leaders but it, all, it went all the way, all the way, trickled all the way to the highest levels. He said, in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. The son of Shaphan, maybe it was his grandson, but Shaphan was one of the men instrumental uh, uh, an associate, a close associate of Jeremiah the prophet, a good man, a godly man, and one instrumental in Josiah's godly reform before all of this happened. But here you have now his son, who was, or perhaps it was his grandson, but now who is supposedly a leader of the 70, and one who was looked to with as one holding great authority, he was right there with the rest of them, offering up their incense. A thick cloud of incense went up. This is the idea. So, you know, a son, a son's faith doesn't always reflect the faith of a father. Uh, So that godly men as it speaks of Shaphan right here, could have an ungodly son. And ungodly men can have godly sons. So, uh, everybody makes their own choices. We are what we are. We are who we are by the choices and decisions we make. You can't blame your mom and dad, even though they may have influenced you right or they may have influenced you wrong. Some of, some of you had parents who were not good influences. And uh, were not godly men or women. And yet, here you are. So you see, you're not destined to repeat their mistakes, their errors, or their sins. You don't have to repeat their values. You don't have to hold to their philosophies. Then there are others who are the products of good and godly parents who fall away fall away into the sins of the world around them. And here you have Jazaniah as an example of that very thing. You have the sons of, uh, you have Hophni and Phinehas. You have 
uh, the sons of Eli. You, you know, you have a, a variety of uh, examples uh, where godly men, their children did not walk in their footsteps, unfortunately. But the point I believe that God was making to Ezekiel here is how pervasive the idolatry was. It went all the way to the top. It went all the way to the highest levels, corruption in the highest levels. He says, verse 12, Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken us. Every man in the chambers, the secret chambers of his own imagination, what are they doing in the dark? What, do you see what they do in the dark? Now, you know, I don't see what people do in the dark. I mean, that's why they do it in the dark. And nobody wants you to know what they do in the dark. But God sees. Amen. Uh, you have to be pretty deceived to think that God doesn't see. Right. You have to have fallen quite a way to think that uh, God doesn't know what's going on in, in the dark, that you can get away with anything, right? right? Do you see what they do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his own imagination, they say the Lord does not see us, for the Lord has forsaken the earth. They were convinced that God had abandoned them. Of course, <coughs> excuse me, that wasn't all. Verse 13, he said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and you will see greater abominations that they do, even worse things. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Now, the north gate of the Lord's house, this was the court of the king and the court of his family. Here's where women sat weeping for Tammuz, mourning, wailing. Tammuz was one of the ancient sun gods. Uh, the Greek equivalent was Adonis. But this was a god of beauty, a god of desire. Uh, he was one of the heathen gods of Babylon and Syria, uh, Tammuz. According to their legend, Tammuz was killed by a, a wild boar while he was hunting, and he descended to the underworld. He was such a handsome man. Even today, people talk about Adonis. You know, he's an Adonis. Well, this is Tammuz, Adonis. Uh, he was brought to the underworld where, where the goddess of the underworld loved him and didn't want to let him go. But Zeus pried him loose, and six months or part of the year, he shared him with uh, Aphrodite on the surface of the earth. So he would come forth in the spring they would weep over him when all the vegetation died, but he would come forth in the spring when all the greenery came out again and uh, they would offer up a sunrise service, which you see in the next few verses. Uh, and, uh, and he would rise again. Verse 15, have you seen this? O son of man, turn again and you'll see greater abominations. He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east. And they worshiped the sun toward the east. The sun coming back, the vegetation coming back, spring ritual, uh, and the worship of Tammuz all over again. Weeping for Tammuz, God called this an abomination. The abominations that they do there. Have you seen these greater abominations, he said? Then he said to me, verse 17, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations that they commit here? 
They filled the land with violence. They provoked me to anger. They put the branch to their nose. This is some weird pagan custom where they would bring this greenery in to, to fragrant and smell it. They'd put it before their face because it supposedly, as the sun god rose in the east, uh, it would keep them from offending the sun god with their sinful breath. So this was some custom that they practiced. Let, let's just say it was not a Jewish custom. Well, I mean, we can agree with that, right? These were not Jewish customs. None of these were customs that God had ordained, prescribed, or commanded. Right. We in agreement with that? Amen. None of these originated with Judaism. They were brought into Judaism from the pagan nations. Here's what I would ask. Was God pleased? Yeah. Was he pleased with that? Did he wink at these things? Yeah. Uh, no, not at all. He called them abominations. Even even though they said, well, look, everybody does it. You know, but, uh, yeah. Doesn't make it right, huh? Right. Now, now, what I want to do today, just in the time that we have left, is to focus just a little bit on a couple of verses, like verse 12. Very interesting verse. What a statement. He says, have you seen what they do in the dark? The sins, the sins that men do in the dark. And to think that they actually had the nerve to say God doesn't see or God doesn't know. When the Bible tells us that the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So, you know, God doesn't miss a thing. Amen. We might think we're getting away with something. We might think that it's hidden, it's secret. It's private. The things we do in the dark are typically the things that we justify. Right. And we excuse it in ourselves. We might think that if other people committed these things or did these things, it would be wrong. But when we do them, somehow we can justify it to our mind, our own mind. We can justify it to ourselves. The Christians who, in the dark, you know, on the sly, in the secret, commit whatever sins they be, justifying it in their own minds. Here's what God told Jeremiah about this very thing. He said, for my eyes are upon their ways. Jeremiah 16, 17. He's talking about Israel. He said, for my eyes are upon their ways. They are not hid from my face. Neither is their iniquity hidden from my eyes. Or as one version translates it, I see everything they do. They cannot hide the things they do. Their sin is not hidden from me. Even the things they do in the dark. Even the things they do in secret. Psalms 90, which uh, is not, no authorship is prescribed to Psalms 90, but many believe it was actually a psalm of Moses, says, Thou hast set, our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance, which basically says, you see everything we do, even the things we do in secret. You know all about us. There's nothing, we know there's nothing we can do. God, as if the dark would hide us from God. Amen. David, knew the futility of trying to hide anything from God. He said in Psalm 60 in verse 5, O oh God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. You know my foolishness. I believe we could all say that. O oh God, you know my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Here's, here's the point that, that I would make. What things whether they're deeds, actions, or thoughts that men hide from others, men and women, you know. They cannot be hidden from God. There's no such thing as secret sin. No sin can be hidden from God. 
There's things that we hide from others. And maybe we try to deny even to ourselves. But God sees. Can I give you a couple more verses? Isaiah 29, 15. Listen to this one. Woe unto them that hide deep their counsel from Jehovah, and whose works are in the dark, and that say, who sees us? Who knows? Well, we know who sees, and we know who knows. Proverbs 5, 21, For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his goings. So God sees where we go. He knows what we do. Or as Hebrews 4.13 uh, 4, says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of whom of him to whom we, we have to do. God sees it all. One of the old Puritan preachers, a fellow by the name of Jeremiah Burroughs, he lived all the way back in the 1600s. He wrote in one of his many sermons, some of which are still extant, but he said, Take heed of secret sins. They will undo thee if loved and maintained. He said, one moth can ruin a garment, one hole can sink a boat, and one sin can damn a soul. It was a powerful sermon uh, that dealt with the fact that many in his day were excusing sins that they did in secret, the things they did in the dark. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul wrote to the Christian church and he said, let a man examine himself. I believe it's a good idea for us to, to do a little checkup, you know, at times, check our own oil, examine ourselves, uh, search our hearts for secret sins, for things that we allow. Maybe it's things you allow to go on in your mind. Thoughts that you allow yourself to think that you know are wrong. You shouldn't allow yourself to think that way. Or are there things that you allow yourself to do and you excuse it in your own mind, you justify it, whatever it may be. I remember years ago, years ago, I read uh, uh, the testimony of a, a Roman Catholic priest who had been a priest for 35 or 40 years, and he said in all those years of hearing confession, he said, I, I heard people confess every kind of sin you can imagine and many you can't imagine, which I, I imagine that was true. But then he said this, I thought it was profound. He said, there's one sin I never heard anybody ever confess. Not once did anyone ever confess that they were covetous. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Not once did they ever say, I'm covetous. You know why that is? Because people don't think they are. They don't think they covet. They, even though it's the Tenth Commandment, thou shalt not covet. Don't covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's goods, your neighbor's things. Don't covet, it, covet anything. Amen. I think that could qualify as one of the secret sins that sometimes we hide and, and we justify in ourselves, maybe because we don't even recognize it for what it is. Sometimes I think... In a society like ours that's very uh, materialistic and, yeah. you know, consumeristic, I think we hide covetousness. Uh, we just give it another name. We call it ambition. Or we call it, uh, you know, the, the drive to, to, to succeed. I just want to acquire. And we won't admit to ourselves that we covet. That we covet things that other people have. That we covet status that other people have. Or that we covet a position that other people have. 
We want that, and we resent it when somebody else gets it, or if we get passed over. We covet another person's pay. We covet another person's uh, neighborhood or whatever. Never have I heard, he said, anyone confess the sin of covetousness. I, I, I thought that was profound. It makes you think that there are in the secret chambers of the heart, as the Bible speaks, that there are hidden things sometimes we don't even recognize in ourselves. You know, I've thought about this as well. You know, people who, who just have a chip on their shoulder, they don't always realize it. It's, just, it's so a part of their personality, they don't realize. The people who are proud, I mean, just haughty, they don't always know. Man, are you stinking proud? They don't know. Maybe they do. But I think sometimes people are oblivious of, of their own, the way they come across. Yeah. Their own haughtiness, arrogance, better than you. Y'all yeah. awake? Yeah. Amen. I, I think sometimes people don't recognize themselves when you talk about uh, any number of things. Uh, gossip. A gossiper never recognizes themselves. No, never. It's always somebody else. Uh, a critical spirit. They don't recognize that in themselves. They criticize everything and everybody, and if you talk about criticism, they don't think it's them. Somebody else. That's critical. Oh yeah, I can think of. I can think of several. Yeah, but they don't don't see it in themselves. We don't recognize things in our own self. There are things in our own hearts that I think we need to ask the Lord to help us to see. These secret chambers behind hidden doors. Maybe they've been hidden so long it's time to turn some rocks over and see what's there. I, I believe that sometimes we can harbor bitterness and resentments towards others. And not even know it's in our heart, not even recognize it for what it is, because it hides under other, under, under other things. And, and we think that whatever bitterness we, we feel, we, we think it's justifiable, therefore it's not bitterness, resentment, and unforgiveness. So you can hear a sermon all about unforgiveness and never recognize it in yourself. I think sometimes... We don't even recognize it when we have a deep, burning hatred for somebody else. A, we, we wouldn't even call it hatred in us. Well, I may not like them. I just don't like them. Maybe you don't recognize what's under the rocks in your own heart. Amen. That what's there is a very angry, bitter thing that God wants to expose Amen. so that we can be delivered from it, yes. so that we can be rid of it. I also know that there are many who wrestle with lusts of all kinds. Our, our society is so permeated with sexuality, sensuality, that it's a, it's a constant 24-7 battle to be free. So men and women have to guard themselves, guard their minds, guard their hearts continually, lest we allow ourselves to sin, as the Bible says, in the hidden chambers of our own imagination. There's a passage in Psalms 19 and verse 12 where the Bible says, who can understand his errors? And then David cries, cleanse thou me from secret sins. Cleanse thou me. Cleanse thou me from secret faults, from secret sins. Deliver me, Lord, from the things that I justify in my own mind and in my own heart. He goes on in Psalms 19 and verse 14 and says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength 
and my Redeemer. Let, let the things I think on, the meditations of my heart, let it be acceptable to you. Remember Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes that I won't look upon a maid. We can make a covenant, a covenant with our eyes, a covenant with ourselves, a covenant with the Lord. Lord, Lord God, cleanse me from secret sins. Don't let my eye wander. Don't let my heart stray. Husbands and wives, we live in the midst of a fornicating society. This is a fornicating society. Sex generates huge revenue. Uh, pornography is America's, perhaps its number one export. We have to guard ourselves, especially when we're alone. It used to be that you'd have to sneak into an X-rated movie theater to see something nasty or an X-rated bookstore to go buy a magazine or something, but not anymore. Amen. Now right here on your phone, in your own pocket, or uh, in your own purse, you can see the most vile, despicable, pornographic, graphic pornographic material. That This is a generation exposed to things that no previous generation has been exposed to. And that it's made sexuality and sensuality so pervasive and so powerful. It's given the demon of lust the greatest power it's ever held on a society. Therefore, we have to guard ourselves from the spirit, the power of, of lust, because it's, it's pervasive. It's everywhere. You see it in the revelations every day, still every day. The news media, the... Hollywood moguls, every day, yeah, yeah, he groped me, yeah, yeah, he, this, that. Look, it goes from the highest levels to the lowest levels. It just all pervasive, spirit of lust, very powerful, and, and I believe growing stronger. It is definitely not growing weaker. Therefore, Christians, you and I, cleanse thou me, Lord, from secret sins, let the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. And you know, we, we had uh, gone through a book, uh, Brother Joe brought some of the men through it, uh, uh, Steve Gallagher book, Worshiping at the Altar of Sexual Idolatry. It was a powerful, powerful book uh, that probably wouldn't be a bad idea for, uh, for us to go through again, you know, uh, but... It's only because we, we, we live in a minefield. I mean, we live in a minefield. Amen. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13, Who that he, whoso covers his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So there's the confessing, that is the acknowledging of sin and the forsaking of sin. That's where we find mercy. So all of these things, I, I, I bring this out because there are things all of us can apply to our personal lives. Amen. Resentments that we allow ourselves to think on. Things you resent against a person, a child, a spouse, a, a, a parent. You know what? You've got to let that stuff go. You can't harbor that. It's poisoning your personality. Right. And it's interfering with your relationship with God. Perhaps you think it doesn't, but it does. Right. It interferes with your prayer life. It interferes with your sensitivity to the Lord. It interferes with your other relationships. When we harbor these things yeah. in the hidden chambers of our heart, our imagination, it interferes. It's an obstacle to our spiritual progress. Can, can we acknowledge that we need God's cleansing and forgiveness? We, we sang today some great songs about being washed in the blood, being forgiven, redeemed, blessed redemption, precious blood that cleanses every sin, every stain, Oh, Lord, we call upon you today. 
And we ask your forgiveness and cleansing, Lord, for our open sins and our secret sins. And we ask for your cleansing, Lord. Cleanse our hearts, our minds, our mouths. Let us see, Lord, what's under the rocks in our own hearts. Expose, Lord, what's there, that we might be free of it and rid of it. That we might walk before you in, in holiness and cleanliness of mind and spirit. Lord, you call us to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. Lord, help us to do so, we pray. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, reveal to us what's under the rocks in our own heart. Forgive us, Lord, for justifying things that we should have long ago repented of. Wash us clean, we pray. Rid us of all of these sins. Help us to love, to forgive, to walk in holiness and purity just as you bid us to. This we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen, amen. Amen, amen.